morning. I brought it. The book I referred to quite a few times last week. Can't have this one. Well, maybe you can. We actually have two copies over on the uh, display case. That's the beautiful cabinet that Mike wrote for us. Where's Mike? Mike, where are you hiding? Hide? There he is, way in the back in the corner. Make sure to stop by and say thank you to Mike for building those beautiful cabinets for us. I would say stop by and tell Matthew thank you for the door that's put in there, but where is he? Home. Oh, he's probably still recouping from the door. <laughs> um, anyway, this is the book that I referred to a number of times last week. Um, it was actually written for Jews by a completed Jew talking about Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures. <clears throat> Absolutely fantastic, uh, especially concerning the topic that we were dealing with last week and we'll be dealing again with today. So, uh, take the opportunity. Um, I was going to say it's a quick read, but I guess it really depends on the person, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um, excellent, excellent material. Um, we are continuing with our Testify. And today I've asked if uh, Jeannie Appleberry would come and share her testimony with us, so if you would give her your attention. And as I look back, 
That time was the start of my earnest search to know God and connect with Him. After Dennis and I had been married for almost 10 years, and our two daughters had been born, we made a big jump from the Catholic Church to what was the Evangelical Free Church here in Stevensville. Dennis's brother, uh, Rex, was pastor there, and we got a lot of teaching from Rex, a lot of Bible teaching from Rex. Uh, so, some very basic things that I needed to understand were starting to dawn on me. One, the first one, I didn't need to lie, cheat, steal, to be considered a sinner. I was a sinner. Mm -hmm. Genesis 5, 1 through 3 says, this is, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. I see that as perfection. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. I believe that the likeness and image is that sin nature. That's how I got it. Number two, I knew there was God the Father. What I did not understand was that I needed someone to save me from my sin nature. That Savior is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach in the Hebrew, whose name means salvation, the anointed one, the anointed salvation. I love his name. When exactly that salvation came, I cannot give you hour, day, month, or year, but this I know, I believe, and Jesus is my Savior. I identify strongly with the story of Abraham. He heard God. He even moved out in obedience to God's call. He left his country, then eventually parted from his own family to fully follow God. I had to do that. I was accused by more than one person in my family of being in a cult. But they have come to accept my departure from Catholicism, not happily by the ones who are still disturbed by my defection from the Catholic Church, but by others, two of my brothers and my sister. I've had the privilege over the last 20 years or so to teach them the Bible and to sit one-on-one -on -one and examine the scriptures together. Back to my reference about identifying with Abraham. Genesis 15, 6 says, Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. From Genesis 11:26 to Genesis 15, 6, I personally see a lot of water under the bridge in the life of Abraham before he pushed all of his chips into the pot and said, I'm in. Not a gambler. That's just what come to my mind. I'm all in. And I'm going to the Lord. I see his story. Uh, I see in his story a belief in God, but it was the but was it the belief unto salvation that was finally reckoned to him in Genesis 15, 6? I'll let you guys ponder that and come up with your own conclusion. Anyway, that's how I see my journey of salvation. Number three, I needed to know God's word from the front to the back. As much as my brain could handle and understand, don't get me wrong, I'm not a Bible expert, and I don't know all that I should know. But however much time God gives me on this earth, my hope is to know and, uh, and understand more of it. Anyway. In the middle to the late 80s, I remember getting up every morning between 4 and 5 and studying the Bible. I was, I was still ignorant of the importance of the Older Testament, but God pushed me to study it. I would dutifully study it and be in awe of what I was learning, then feeling guilty because the Newer Testament was where Jesus, my Savior, was spoken of. I would study the book. And God would always give me that feeling of, okay, that's good, but get thee back into the Old Testament where I told you to be studying. And so for years, I poured over the Older Testament, and a fuller picture of God, the triune God, began to emerge. Jesus, my Savior, is there in the Old Testament from Genesis 1-1. And if you want to just cross-reference for your own information, cross-reference into the New. John 1, 1 through 18, Colossians 1, 15 through 19. 
You may have a red letter Bible that highlights the words of Jesus, but the whole Bible needs to be in red, red letters from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22 21. I heard Arnold Huttenbaum say that. The whole Bible needs to be in red letters. I agree. In 1993, when we made our first trip to Israel with Zola Levitt, the one thing I knew I wanted to do was to be baptized in the Jordan River. As a Catholic child, you're automatically baptized as a baby, and so I was. But I had no choice to make in the matter. Now as an adult, I had the choice and the great privilege to be baptized in the very jo River Jordan that my Savior was baptized in. The believing Jewish man who prayed over me after I dumped myself, for that's how the Jews do it, prayed some specific prayers over me and I have seen them come to pass. Here's my conclusion. This I know. God is good. No matter what happens to me personally and around me, I know that God knows what is best for me. And I attempt every day to stay on the path that he has laid out for my life. And I'd like to read to you Psalm 121. Psalm 121 is what's called a psalm of ascent. It's a song to the Lord as the people of God would ascend to Jerusalem three times a year to keep the appointed feasts of the Lord. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Amen. That's it. <laughs> tremendous resource for me. I like to bounce things off of them. Sometimes they come back a lot harder than I expect. <laughs> but they know God's Word and, and the totality of His Word. You know, when we did our baby dedication here a few months back, I was very frustrated because I wanted a compact Bible to give to the kids. And all of the baby dedication Bibles that I could find were New Testament only. Okay. If you have to choose, I would choose the New Testament, the revelation of our, our Messiah, our Savior. But you don't really understand that without the foundation of the Old Testament. And so I, I went out of my way to actually buy Old and New Testaments for the babies. And uh, because I am that convinced, you know, we talked last week um, about Jesus appearing in the Old Testament. Uh, so I gave you a number of scriptures. Uh, if you need reference to those, check the book, check the video. Um, but um, Dennis and Jeannie have both made quite a study of the Old Testament. Use them as a resource. Feel free to use them as a resource, which on the spot. <laughs> okay. Um, we are still in Colossians. Uh, I'm actually going to finish up verse 15. But. Uh, Stephen and we have a song that I think is particularly appropriate, so I'm going to turn it over to
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created. All things were created through Him and for Him. Starting in verse 15, I'm going to read the passage again. We're going to work, continue working through this passage. 
Paul writes in Colossians 1, verse starting in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Last week we talked a bit about he is the image of the invisible God. And I, I love that phrase because it so well puts how God appeared to man in the Old Testament, and yet man was not allowed to see the face of God unless he died. And we, we talked about that quite a bit last week. And this week we're going to move on. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the firstborn of all creation. I, I want to address this specifically because there tends to carry with this, even though we don't really verbalize it, we tend to carry the idea uh, that Jesus was born. I know in several cults, they use this passage to talk about Jesus being a created being. Uh, well, I want to let you know right now, that's not the case. Okay? Jesus that walked on the earth being fully man and fully God was still fully God. Okay? Jesus, when confronted by the Pharisees, said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. Okay, so he was from creation. But I want to address this, this uh, firstborn of creation because I came across an interesting thing when I was doing my studies. And I, I actually panicked this week because I'm all over everywhere when I study. My studies are kind of like <coughs> taking a grenade and throwing it in a library. And then, you know, that's, that's how I start my studies. And then I go through and I start sorting through all these. And I have notes everywhere on all kinds of stuff. I couldn't remember where I read this. And so this week I was starting to panic because I really wanted to share this with you. Because I think it's really cool. Now, um, I did find it. It's from a commentary by John Gill. And I'm going to read to you a little bit of what he said. Uh, speaking specifically on the firstborn of every creature. John Gill says, not the firstborn not the first of creation, or the first creature God made. For all things are said to be created by him, and therefore he himself can never be a creature. Nor is he first in the new creation, for the apostle in the context is speaking of the old creation, and not the new. But the sense either is that he was begotten of the Father in a manner inconceivable and inexpressible by men, before any creatures were in being. Okay, did you get that? Created in a way we don't get. Yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta dumb things down for myself sometimes, okay? Because they use big, lofty words. I tend to like simple things, okay? Either he was created in a way we don't understand, or, oh no, there it is. The front of your bulletin. We have a Greek word. Tit. This is the Greek from which we derive firstborn. Okay? Now here's an interesting thought that John Gill shares that I want to share with you. Okay? I ended with or, okay, that he is the first parent, or bringer forth of every creature into being, the word will, excuse me, the word will bear to be rendered, if instead of, now see, we have our word here, our Greek word, okay, this is actually two words, it's a compound word, and the way we get firstborn, see where the little accent is right there, that is where they separate the words, Firstborn. Okay? Now, 
Interestingly enough, this little accent was not in the original Greek. This was something that was put in after to help us understand the context of the word usage. If we move that accent over one letter, okay, move it over one letter, if you're looking at it to the right, the word becomes first parent. Okay? Now, does this cause us any dilemma? Is there an error in Scripture? No, there's not an error in Scripture. Keep in mind, we believe that all Scripture is God's read, inerrant in the original language. Okay? We might have problems with this because our English language is not really equipped to be as flexible as the Greek language. I love cheeseburgers. I love my dog. I love my children. I love my wife. There would be at least three different uses for love in the Greek for that, okay? At least three, possibly four, okay? English is not a very flexible language. Greek was incredibly flexible, okay? So, the thing that I thought was really cool is, and this doesn't cause us a dilemma, it actually opens up doors for us. Because if he is the firstborn of creation, we go back, we say, oh yeah, we understand that because... Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? Now, we can't be speaking chronologically because he was born 2,000 years ago. And we know a lot of people that were born before him. So, we know that's not a true statement, right? But if he is the firstborn of creation, who did God intend to be born first? Adam or the second Adam? Uh, had to be the second because he knew where creation was going to go. He had to have a plan and effect. Remember we talked last week? This is not plan B. The cross was not plan B. Okay? The 400 years of silence was not God scrambling around in heaven trying to figure out how to undo this mess. That's not the case. Okay? So, if he is the firstborn... I believe, if this is translated first point correctly, I believe that it has to be that he was the first one intended to be created. I have to do this first, just like we need a sure foundation before we can build a solid house. The foundation was laid in place before Adam was created, before the earth was called into being, before light was separated from darkness, before any of that was. Now, picture this. I'm going to humanize God a little bit. Okay, just because we have to try and understand an infinite God with our puny brains. So God and the Holy God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus are, are communing. And they want to create. But knowing all things at all times, they knew, well, if we proceed with this, it's all doomed to destruction. It's going to be a mess. We're going to need a way in which to handle all things. Now see, I'm already humanizing it because I'm putting it chronologically. God is not bound by time. We are bound by time. Okay? God exists outside of time. He sees all things at all times. Okay? So it wasn't like this logical thought process like I do where I break it down into pieces. God just looks at it all and does it all. You know, it's like those weird people that do math in their head without going... <laughs> 13 okay God can do that all at once so God is looking God the triune God is looking at creation why would God create man with an opportunity to sin to ruin himself why Come on. If you've read his word, he tells you in his word. What? He doesn't want puppets. He doesn't want puppets. How much mercy does God get to show if the creation is perfect? There's no need to show mercy. There's no need to show mercy. There's no need for grace. If the creation is perfect, there is no need for God to show fully half of who he is. Okay? My simple brain. Alright. 
Okay? This, this is my thinking. This is how I reason this out. Okay? I know I'm going to stand before God someday. And you're going to stand before God someday. And you're going to say, that's what he said. <laughs> God will probably say something like, well, he was ignorant. Just like you. Okay? So, so th this is my rationale. Because in Romans, Paul tells us that it was that God might show his great mercy. Okay? Now, well, I'm not even going to go We'll leave that one out for another day. So, if he is the firstborn of creation, from the moment of the conception of the idea to create, there was a commitment for God to sacrifice his son on our behalf. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Okay? Now, we have thousands of years from the moment of creation until the moment of redemption. We have thousands of years till the cross. We have, so far, thousands of years from the moment of redemption to the moment of completion. Okay? Because right now, we're in what we call the, the, the season of the Gentiles. Again, going back to Romans, Paul says that for a time... Is everybody else hot? Is it okay if I turn the fan on? <laughs> okay? Uh, don't watch these little spinny bitties. Oops. Which one? This one. I think it's just your shirt. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> now, this would be a good shirt to preach on hell, wouldn't it? <laughs> Where was I? I got off of my notes. I'm sorry? Created. Created. Okay, so if he is the firstborn of creation, then we understand that he is created of God from before we have creation to fulfill God's plan, that God might show to us his abundant mercy. That's what I was talking about. We're in the season of the Gentiles. Okay? Uh, Romans tells us that for this time, the Jews appear as an enemy to us. Okay? And this is so that you and I might come to know God, that we might be saved. That's amazing to me. This astounds me. It astonishes me. Because that would like be like me setting aside my children in favor of yours. For a time. Okay. Setting aside my children to the point where for that time they would hate me. They would be my enemy. For your kids. Okay. Now God being God... There will come a time that they will be saved. His word also tells us that. Okay? That the branch that has been broken off will be engrafted again. The natural branch. Okay? We're the wild branches. We're the wild child. I haven't been wild a day in my life. <laughs> and not that I can remember. <laughs> okay? But, but we're the wild children. We're the wild branches that, that God has engrafted into the vine that is Jesus Christ. Okay? They will again be engrafted. Okay, so we have for a time, if Jesus is the firstborn of creation, way back when, beyond our understanding of when, for our sake, that this creation might be restored unto the Father. Now, if the interpretation is, move that little accent over, the first parent, ah, let's go back and read again. I'm going to change this, just this little phrase with moving the accent on, okay? He is the image of the invisible God, the first parent of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in all things, in him all things hold together. Do you see the difference in how that means? Doesn't that just make it marvelous? Does it diminish being the firstborn? Not at all. Not a bit. Because either way, God saw fit that Christ would be born of a woman. The eternal, ever-existent Christ would be born of a woman. Come to earth on our behalf. Right? I just thought that was so cool. I just thought this was an absolutely amazing insight. Now, 
Are there other places that this word is used like that? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit further. Um, well, actually, I don't know if I copy all this. Let me read a little bit further. Um, first parent or first creator, and rather this may be done, seeing that the accents were added after the apostles' days, and especially seeing as it makes his reasoning in the following verses appear with much more beauty. Okay? Makes it appear with much more beauty, strength, and forth. Uh, force. He is the first parent of every creature, for by him were all things created. Or it may be understood of Christ as the King, Lord, and Governor of all creatures. Being God's firstborn, he is the heir of all things. The right of government belongs to him. He is higher than the kings of the earth or the angels in heaven, the highest rank of creatures, being the creator and upholder of all the following. Oops. Upholder of all, as the following words show. So the Jews make the word firstborn to be synonymous with the word king explaining, and then it goes into a whole bunch of Greek stuff that I'm not going to bother you guys with. Okay? If you want to take a look at it, I'll, I will print off the full article by John Gill. Really interesting meaning. Does it have any bearing on eternity for us? Absolutely not. Okay? Don't be conflicted by this. I just thought it made the reading really cool. I mean, it's cool anyway that God would create a way for us to have eternity. But being the creator, it just makes it so much, makes so much more sense to me. Okay, so, moving forward, let, let me just reiterate one thing. Okay, I'm going to go back to where I started. The firstborn of all creation, we know that can't be that creation like we are a created being. That can't be because of the following verse whereby he created everything. So, it has to be either in a way that is inconceivable to us, that we can't understand, or there's another option. All right? So, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this gives us a problem. We've got to go back to our statement. Do we really believe that what we believe is really real? Do we really believe this statement? Uh, you can answer that one. Yes. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Now, I'm going to share a little bit with you. Remember when we first started talking about Colossians, we talked about how G, uh, not Jesus, Paul was dealing with the pre-Gnostics. Okay? Gnosticism, those that had to have mysterious knowledge to gain favor with God. And how that was starting to insinuate itself in the church even at this age. Okay? Now, what he is talking about here, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, he is talking right into the face of some heresy that was starting to come out in the church, whereby Jesus was a created being, probably at the same elevation as an angel, an angelic being. Now, we know a lot about this from Jehovah's Witness, okay? Oh, you know, he's, he's probably, what do they call him, uh, Michael? Yeah, okay, was, oh, he's Michael. Um, Paul is dealing with this because the way that this renders is that he is talking about things visible and invisible. He is talking about things not just on our physical realm, but he is also talking about things in a spiritual realm. Okay? So when he says he has dominion over all things, that even submits under his feet angelic beings, whether demonic, fallen angels, or, or heavenly angels. All things, even the archangel Michael, <coughs> are submitted under him. Okay? So, when we're talking, remember we talked about the Gnostics, he's already starting to deal with this issue right here. Okay? Now, how does it give us a problem? Because if this is true, <clears throat> how do you feel about President Obama now? Knowing that he is appointed of Christ, now, no, notice what it says down here. Created through him and for him. Look, I'm going to share something with you. You're a tool. Okay? I'm going to share something else with you. 
President Obama is a tool. Okay? Everything in creation is a tool to be used as Jesus Christ sees fit. What does Paul say? Some for noble purposes, some for ignoble purposes. Cleanse yourself of the latter and you'll be usable as the former. Okay? There are some people who will forever be used of ignoble purposes to further God's purposes. Listen to me. If we really believe that what this says is really real, then nothing is moving apart from the sovereignty of God. Okay? All this garbage going on in the Middle East is not moving apart from the sovereign will of God. God knows it. He took it into account. He has planned with that accommodation. So when <clears throat> we have an election and we have somebody elected to office that we just heartily disagree with, absolutely. I oppose. Well, quite honestly, I can't think of much of anything that I agree with in our current administration. There's not a lot that I've seen that I can even agree with. Okay? Part of that is because of my faith. And part of that is just because of my political ideology. We need to be careful to separate the two. God doesn't care if you have a gun. You can't see anywhere in here where it says that God says you got to have a gun. Okay? My political ideology says the Constitution guarantees us the right. Now, let's be careful to separate the two. Okay, so, but this gives us a problem because if we really believe that God has put him in authority over us, how then are we supposed to respond to that? <clears throat> Absolutely, but what else? Oh, gosh. yeah. See, Romans 13, don't, don't turn there, I'm just going to hit a couple verses real quick. Actually, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll hit this and then I'm going to back up because I want to show one other thing before we move on. Uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Okay? So, Osama bin Laden was a tool. Adolf Hitler was a tool. Mao Zedong was a tool. Ronald Reagan was a tool. But remember, for noble or ignoble purposes. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 18, uh, verse 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is the word of the Lord coming to Jeremiah. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Does this, does this sound familiar to anybody? The potter's hand, does that sound kind of like the drawings? Where Paul says, well, the, the, the potter, he saved to the maker, what would you do of me? Kind of sound familiar? See, that the, the Old Testament isn't that far removed from the New Testament. Okay? So you are in my hand, O house of Israel, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I have intended to do to it. Now see, really what he's saying here is I get to do as I will because it's mine. It's mine. Okay? Just like the, the blessings and the cursings. Okay? If you do these things, you will be blessed. If you do these things, you will be cursed. Okay? God gets to do as He wills with His creation. Specifically, going back to Colossians, Jesus gets to do as He wills with His creation. Okay? John chapter 19. So Pilate said to him, speaking to Jesus, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. 
Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Now, if I were Pilate, my, my thought is not going to go to God Almighty in heaven. My thought is going to Caesar Almighty in Rome. When Jesus references that, I mean, really. Because then it says, oh, he, he tried to set him free from that point on. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Okay? Um, we obviously understand, in light of the rest of Scripture, that this is coming from God. God put Pilate there for that time. God put Rome there for that time. Now, I don't understand the fullness of God's mind. I'm sure there were many, many other things accomplished according to God's will by Rome being an empire. But I don't think there's any more of them that are any more significant than this. Or as significant as this. God established him for that time that his son might die on a cross. Okay? So, all authority is established at the whim of Jesus. To do as he wills. Now, I, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to back up for just a second because I want to address authority. I jumped ahead in my notes. So, uh, John chapter 1, we're talking about the authority that Jesus has. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It's just like the start of the song that Angie sang this morning. Um, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay? So, what was created apart from Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. Lucifer was created by Jesus. You get that? You get that? The fallen angels were created by Jesus. Now, again, I don't understand the mind of God. Being human, being a sissy, I want the easy way. I don't want the hard way. Okay? I don't like it when things get rough. Okay? I want it easy. God did not choose the easy way. You think God was surprised when Lucifer exalted himself? <coughs> no, he wasn't. Do you think maybe Lucifer was a tool so that by his downfall, the serpent would come into the garden and treacherously deal with Adam and Eve, thereby causing them to fall, thereby allowing God an opportunity to show how magnificent a grace and mercy he has? He's a tool. Okay? Hebrews chapter 1 says, Long ago, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance and the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. See, I don't understand all things about the Trinity of God. I don't understand necessarily how he was created, but he is God. I don't, I, I, quite honestly, I don't care. you got to come to the point where you understand you don't need to know everything. Because you never will know everything. You're never going to have all the answers. And if you ever think you have all the answers, you're probably somewhere between the ages of 13 and 19. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> because somewhere after that, you have a child, and you realize you don't know anything. <clears throat> you wouldn't believe how many times Daddy has asked me a question. I'll say, I don't know, let's go look it up. I don't know. I know a lot of things. 90% of it's absolutely useless. It does me no benefit at all. But it's stuck in there. Okay? My goal 
is to make the useless knowledge diminish and the useful knowledge increase. Okay? So, God gave Jesus all authority. I don't understand how that works, but I understand that it is so. I understand that through Jesus being God, God created everything. It's his, his workmanship. He gets to do with it as he will. I also understand that nothing moves apart from his hand. You imagine the tap dancing going on in hell when Jesus was nailed up on the cross. Oh yeah, we won! More fools they. Because it was through their victory that God accomplished the greatest victory of all time. Amen? You don't think God knew what was going on? You don't think God knew what was going on? So, I want to share this with you. See, you're a tool. Understand that in your heart. And understand that part of being a tool is you can be used willingly or you can be used unwillingly. You want to glorify God. Be a tool that is used willingly for whatever role He has you in. If God has you as a plunger, be the best plunger that you can possibly be to His glory. You understand that? Because see, we all want the glory jobs. I want to be the gold hammer. How many carpenters have a gold hammer? <laughs> really, you think they're ever going to use that for anything? Don't in your arrogance presume to tell God how he can and cannot use you. Okay? God will use you as he sees fit. It is not about your glory. It is about his. His glory. Okay? And if that means that you're a plunger, plunge for his glory. Okay? Don't fight. Don't argue. Don't bicker. Serve. Serve. Serve where he puts you to whatever end he needs you. That's where glory is. That's where glory is. That's where we learn to praise God that we are worthy to suffer abuse in His name. We're Christians. How dare they? Really? Look, you know, we think things are ugly in America now. Thermodynamics tells us that when things left to themselves, they will deteriorate. And when we kick God out of the picture, things are left to themselves and they're going downhill. Okay? Are you going to be the one that will stand firm or are you going to be one of those that came out from among us because you were not of us? But I'll tell you the truth, you can't get it together when it's going easy. What makes you think you're going to get it together when it's going hard? I want to share with you something that, that I hope encourages you because it encourages me tremendously. <clears throat> I have a, a hiatal hernia. No, I don't want that to encourage you. <laughs> I cannot figure out for the life of me what sets this thing off. There are just times that it just decides, all right, you've had enough good days, it's time for a bad day. Mm -hmm. and, and yesterday marked the end of an era. I did my last 12-year-old talk. <laughs> yep. So my 12-year-old my talks are done. I am available for rent, <laughs> but only for the males. Okay? <clears throat> But I took Thaddeus out yesterday, and we always make a big deal of it. We, we go out to dinner, we have our talk, we go to a movie, we hang out as guys, okay? 
Um, yesterday was my last one. Now, I don't know what it was, but about 2 o'clock this morning, I woke up hurting. Okay, and sometimes a couple of Tylenol will take care of it enough that I can go back to sleep. This morning, didn't even touch it. So I got these pills, Endosec. Okay, now, honestly, I don't know how drug addicts can do it. That stuff makes me so sick. So at 2.30, I took an endoset, and I told Christy, just pray for me, because it usually is about a 12 to 14 hour span that I just, things are spinning and I'm nauseous, and got up this morning, Christy called me, and I, I got up, and I said, how are you doing? So well, I haven't got up right yet. I'll tell you in a few minutes. So I got up, and sure enough, anytime I move my head, things just start going, Whoosh. and immediately after, Whoosh, my stomach goes, Ugh. okay. I got here this morning, and things were still doing it, standing there in worship. I had to keep my eyes closed. Since I've stood up to deliver his word, it has not bothered me once. Okay. See, when you're doing what God has called you to do, he gives you what is necessary to do what he's called you to do. Okay. I don't look at me for any glory in that because I give all glory to God. Because quite honestly, this morning, I even came in and I warned Steve, hey, the notes are in my Bible. Okay, if I got a bail, at least you have something to work off of. And he laughed kind of like he's doing now. <laughs> And then I think he really started praying. <laughs> okay. God is marvelous. He's absolutely fantastic. And if there's anything in this life that you can trust, it's going to be you. Okay? The road he may take you down may be ugly. It may be hard. It may be bumpy. It may be difficult. He didn't tell you it was going to be easy. He told you he was going to be there with you. And he will. Okay? Be the best plunger you can be for his sake. Amen? Amen. Amen.